very good uh, Friday afternoon to everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you at our session on uh, poverty and uh, inequality proofing of policies for a twer twin transition. Thanks for your interest, uh, for coming here and for joining <coughs> us uh, uh, online as well. Um, this is a kind reminder that the session will be in English and I believe there is an uh, online interpretation to French and German. So, the main topic of our um, session today is the use of distributional impact assessment. This is what we call uh, in our jargon DIA. And you should learn this um, uh, acronym because we will be using it uh, a lot today. So, distributional impact assessment. Um, what, what is this uh, DIA? Uh, it is some. Um, uh, it is an analysis uh, uh, with which we look at how certain policy actions impact the income of um, different groups. So, for example, will my tax reform influence uh, the income of the middle class, uh, or the rich, or the poor? Um, and this allows the policymakers to uh, see the impacts of their decisions or planned decisions in terms of poverty and inequality. So it is indeed, indeed an informal, uh, important tool, uh, especially when we think of the ongoing and upcoming uh, transformations uh, in terms of digital and green uh, transitions. Um, with this in mind, the European Commission uh, has actually published um, uh, around a year ago a communication on better use of the distributional impact assessment. Uh, I believe colleagues will put the link uh, on the chat for those uh, uh, who are interested to learn more. But now, let me introduce our distinguished speakers today. Uh, uh, we will hear from Cinzia Alcidi, uh, who is the head of the Economic Policy and Jobs and Skills Unit at the Center for European Policy Studies. Uh, she will provide us with a keynote speech and will uh, help us to understand the transmission channels uh, and social risks uh, of the digital transformation. Uh, Sara de la Rica uh, will be our next panelist. Um, she's a director of the ISEAC Foundation and will focus on the counterfactual evaluations in the field of employment policies with uh, some concrete examples from Spain, I believe. Uh, Salvador Barrios. Uh, the head of the fiscal policy analysis team at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission uh, will give us some insights uh, on tools, how to run uh, the DIA and uh, uh, how to show an impact um, uh, of the green and digital transition and related policies on social outcomes. Last but not least, Karina Dodley, uh, Senior Research Officer and Coordinator of Tax, Welfare and Pension Research Area at the Economic and Social Research Institute in Ireland. And she will present uh, us with some DIA examples from Ireland and how automation uh, can impact uh, income inequality in Europe. So, some interesting uh, uh, stuff uh, ahead of us, for sure. Uh, but before we enter into the subject, uh, just a couple of organizational points. Uh, I am reminding uh, our speakers to be aware of their time limit uh, uh, so that we uh, stick uh, to uh, our uh, allocated time. And uh, towards the end, for the last uh, 20 minutes or so, we will have also a questions and answer session with you and with the online participants uh, uh, as well. Uh, you will be able to insert your questions in a, a Slido tool, which I believe uh, will be shown or is being shown. And um, uh, there you can formulate your questions as the speakers speak and we will uh, take them up uh, at the end of uh, at the panel. Uh, so now let's give it a start. Uh, Cinzia, the floor is yours. So. Um Thank you very much for inviting me because actually I took the opportunity to, um, to come here and to think about what to share with you, uh, trying to put together some of the thinking and some of the results of different projects on which we have been working uh, during the last months. Um, this includes uh, actually one project that we are running for DG Employment, which is uh, about the impact of uh, the digital transformation on uh, um, poverty and inequality but also to all the broader Horizon uh, 2020, Horizon Europe projects 
on uh, um, social investment on the one hand and uh, um, on the um, global transformations, plural, so no, not only digital, on uh, inequality. And uh, basically for me, the, the bottom line is that we are trying to address issues which are extremely complex, in which many dimensions uh, um, are involved and um, for which the transmission mechanisms that are at work in the economy, but also at social level, are not fully understood. So my purpose is actually to share some reflections and try to disentangle some of, of these uh, mechanisms. So um, this is uh, um, the, the, the outline of my presentation. If I don't mind, I stand. So uh, the first really is, uh, is digital transformation raising uh, social risks? And I will come uh, to you in a moment trying to define what I mean by social risks. And my main point will be trying to understand what is the, the, the role of the labor market functioning and the outcome that we see on, on the labor market. But at the same time, also trying to look at access to social services and social uh, protection as basically a way to understand uh, social risks and how they then lead to social outcomes. Then I will try to show you some evidence with open questions. And then finally, policy dimension and, of course, uh, distributional impact assessment, what role uh, distributional impact assessment can have. Now, uh, background. So what do I mean by social risks? Social risks I basically mean exposure of individuals or households to life events which are uh, driven or associated with the digital transformation. Give you some example. This is uh, obstacles to enter the labor market, losing jobs, losing income, but in general, a lack of opportunities to be better off. Uh, this is what I mean by uh, social risks. And uh, um, I would argue that social risks depends basically on the initial socioeconomic condition of the individual or, and the households, and then um, by how on, on how the labor market functions and the access and accessibility, actually, uh, to public services, mostly education and learning and healthcare, uh, but also to the availability and access of social protection. Um, both the dimension linked to social investment and the one linked to uh, social protection. And my main point is that if you want to prepare and protect against social risks, Basically, you need to understand how the digital transformation, which I should have said that I'm focusing on the digital transformation, affects the functioning of the labor market, but also the way um, uh, people can access services and benefits and the way these are distributed and offered by the government. Um, and this is actually, this will not really uh, it's not a question for today, but I think these transformations are deeply affecting and raising challenges for the welfare state in terms of understanding what are the new needs which are generated by the, uh, the transformation, but also how governments are incorporating uh, digitalization or even artificial intelligence in the way that, that they provide services. And then last but not least is really limited resourcing and fiscal constraints that all welfare states are facing across Europe. But let me try to, to explain a bit better what, what, what I mean. I mean, very often we, we try to, to, to focus, <coughs> to go from digital transformation to social outcomes. As I said, what I'm interested in is what is in the middle. And basically here I, tr I try to, uh, if you want, pedagogical purpose, trying to um, uh, disentangle uh, the, all the different mechanisms that are um, at work. And here I put COVID. This is uh, maybe we forgot about COVID, but uh, I think COVID for the digital transformation was a key point because it really forced an experiment whereby uh, technological ad adoption has been forced um, to be adopted uh, to a speed and to an extent that would not have been possible um, otherwise. So in this sense, it's, it's not the pandemic per se, but the response to the pandemic and what he, um, it forced people to, um, to do and uh, to, to adapt. 
And then basically I put on the one end the, the, the labor market structure. And here I have uh, labor demand and labor supply, the matching between the two and the role of labor market institutions. I will give you example for each of those in a moment. And then on the other side, we have access to public services and social benefits. And here my main focus is essentially on education and training, health systems and social protections. So I think digital transformations is a source of opportunities. Sorry, I'm not only focusing on the bad side. So I'm not only saying that there are bad sides, but I think for the purpose of today and thinking about risks is mostly on, on the negative side. Uh, um, these are sources, the way the labor market structure uh, is structured and functions and the way access to public services and social benefit uh, happens uh, determines social risks. And the, the outcome, if you want, the, the result, uh, which it can be employment, unemployment, earning wages, you can think many other different ways, uh, basically leads to, to social equity and overall, I think, to, to economic growth. We will not go in this part. We will uh, remain essentially on, on the first two uh, boxes. Um, but let me give you an example of uh, what I have in mind. So um, for, for the labor market, um, I identified the first four uh, channels, so labor demand, labor supply matching, and labor market institutions, and the, the kind of sorry, the kind of oops, the kind of mechanism that uh, I have in mind for labor demand is basically technological adoption in production systems like automation, robotization, or artificial intelligence can lead to job creation and job distraction, which are can lead to risks which are associated with changes in the, for instance, the employment status or the socioeconomic status, like uh, becoming inactive or unemployed. For the labor supply, the key element is skills. I think there is a parallel sessions really on skills. And the risk is whether people have the capacity or the ability to meet the labor market requirement by acquiring the necessary uh, skills, in this case, say, uh, digital skills, matching, uh, technological transformation, I put social media and uh, matching platforms, LinkedIn, but also others, as a tool to make sure that demand and supply uh, meet. The question, the kind of risk that can emerge from this is really the, the ability for individuals to exploit those opportunities or to remain out of the matching process. And of course, labor market institutions, and here a critical example is a typical work arrangements well, for which uh, limited uh, protections of, of rights or change in employment status can be a major source of, of risk. And then the, there is a part which is really related to the, to the welfare system, and then it's provision of education and the fact that technological transformation and made possible uh, distance learning, e-learning, and here, again, opportunities, but also what is the quality of such kind of, of learning, um, whether everyone has really the, the possibility and the tools to, to access um, those, um, those tools. Uh, then provision of a healthcare. I mean, uh, there, there is a lot of progress, for instance, uh, distance diagnosis. Um, here the question is, this can uh, make it more efficient, especially for, for government and health systems, but I think it's still not very clear whether this is uh, um, uh, sufficiently uh, personal and personalized, um, whether everyone has uh, equal access to, to this kind of uh, new provisions, new ways of provide healthcare. And then last but not least, delivery of social benefits. Uh, governments, many governments uh, are uh, introducing um, eGov platforms, for instance, uh, uh, for requesting benefits and accessing benefits. The purpose, of course, is to increase uh, the take-up rates. Still unclear whether this is the case. So take-up rates and rates and accessibility uh, become um, a key measure to, to understand the risks to which uh, people are, are exposed. So this is incomplete. I think this list can become much longer. 
Uh, but I think it's, it's an example of the kind of, of mechanism that can let us understand how we move from a process of digital transformation to certain social outcome and uh, the capacity of the welfare to um, uh, support uh, individuals. Now, this is a, the premises, if you want. Let's now move to something that is closer to um, uh, um, uh, the, the impact assessment, the distributional impact assessment. Now, everything that I explain has a major measurement challenge. Uh, what I, I described and in general, uh, the impact of digital transformations and the risks associated to it is an extremely challenging uh, task um, in the measurement. Uh, and the, the idea is that basically we need to operationalize and, 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 and measuring, first of all, the digital transformation, which is uh, two words, but which uh, actually is an umbrella uh, for, for a lot of, of change, and searching for causality link, linkages. This, this is really very complicated because basically there are a lot of different dimensions with, that are at stake and the, uh, essentially measure the different aspects that are listed, for instance, uh, in, the, uh, in the table uh, uh, before. So uh, technological adoption in, in production system, uh, how do we measure this? Uh, uh, what is the, and how do we measure the endowment of, of skills and so on, uh, so forth. Now, uh, I want to give you um, an example. So uh, some of my colleagues uh, have been working now for uh, almost two years uh, on this study, which basically attempts to, to, uh, to measure the impact of the digital transformation on, on poverty and on, on inequality. And I want to share with you some of the, the results, but also some of, of the reflections which really come from, um, uh, from the study. Uh, in the study, that there is an assessment of the macroeconomic impact and the microeconomic impact of, of the digital transformation. And basically, one of the first challenges was uh, how do we measure digital transformation? What kind of indicators are actually telling us uh, what kind of transformation is relevant in order to measure the impact on, 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 the, labor, um, um, on the labor market. And basically, the whole study is uh, centered around three indicators, digital capital intensity, robot density, and the level of digital skills. And basically, what we found with a certain degree of surprise is that basically the change, for instance, in the digital capital intensive didn't have uh, a big impact on the level of employment, work, um, worked hours, hours worked, and earnings during the period 2010-2019. And I have to say this came quite uh, as, as a surprise. Also, what we found that, for instance, uh, the endowment of digital skills only have a small positive effect on employment. Um, of course, as all economists, uh, uh, we found good explanation for this. That's uh, mostly um, our job. So we can uh, say that actually the economy managed to, uh, to do or to deal with, to adapt and to deal with the digital transformation well because there was no major impact. But you could also um, uh, argue that in fact, during these two decades that were taken into consideration, sorry, the decade taken into consideration, the digital transformation was not as deep as to deliver a big transformation in the labor market. Or the indicators that we consider are actually partial. So are only capturing one dimension of, of the digital transformation. Second point, um, on the micro, also at, at micro level, the, the, the results, are, if you want, are quite limited in the sense in size, in the terms of, of amplitude, um, and basically broadly confirm uh, the fact that uh, um, the economy was able to deal pretty well um, with the digital transformation, and, and basically this didn't have any, almost any effect on the probability of uh, 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 sorry, losing uh, a job. So high probability of remaining in employment if you were already employment in 2010. So I think that there are some important questions that, w that we need to, to ask. Do these findings tell us uh, that basically we shouldn't care about social risk associated to the, to the digital transformation? 
And my answer is no. It's not because uh, I do not believe in, in the results, but because I think um, the digital transformation, broadly defined, is so big and is a trend that moves quite slowly, now it is accelerated, that we should not necessarily expect to find exact impacts on the labor market or labor market indicators. So I think that, and I guess some of the speakers uh, coming next to me um, will uh, give concrete examples. I think we really need to, to focus on more specific aspects of the digital transformation, maybe automation, maybe robotization, and trying to capture the impact on the labor market rather than going for too broad um, uh, indicators. There is, I think, an issue from a statistical point of view that you need to have enough variation, actually, to, to find significant results. The second point, which I think is more important, and leads me to the last two slides of my presentation, is that uh, I, I think we really need to ask, to, to what extent is this finding or what happened in the previous decade of guidance for the future? And here, I believe that uh, the guidance that we should expect from those results is very limited. And in particular, thinking of the recent change induced by artificial intelligence, I think the world of 2019 is very different from the world uh, of today. And uh, um, we really need to, to invest much more in understanding um, the, un the, the impacts of, of the digital transformation and uh, really what are the, uh, the mechanisms um, at work. Um, exactly because there are major transformations on, on, ongoing, and these are very widespread across the economy. The second point, and I return to, um, to what I said earlier, is I really believe that COVID is, uh, um, uh, is a structural change. Um, I, maybe there are different views, but uh, um, I do believe that it's a structural change, and uh, if the, you have a structural change, it's very difficult to draw or to infer from what it happened. Um, earlier. Now, from a policy perspective, what does it mean? I think the first thing that we need to, uh, to, to, to recollect is, uh, okay, what are the tools that are available to policymakers? Because based on, on the tools, you really re need to build the menu and then say, okay, what are the aspects on which I should focus in order to, to respond to those risks, in order to avoid that they become negative social outcomes. And I, I think that there are two, uh, two main layers, if you want. Uh, the first one is, uh, if you want, the regulatory approach. Uh, I think that the, the Commission in the last year has focused quite a lot on, 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 on this. Uh, so regulatory approach in, in the labor market, I think that the most clear example is the Platform Workers Directive proposal. Um, and then, of course, that there is the typical tools of the welfare state. So uh, here we go back to really to investment and, and social protection. I think these are key uh, in order to, uh, to um, mitigate and adapt in the face of, of social risk. But I think that there is an important effort that needs to be done to understand what are the new needs uh, that are generated from uh, the digital transformation and uh, um, what are the, the proper tools to, to intervene. And the second one, which is uh, uh, something uh, which is more recent, is really the, the investment that many governments are making in the digitalization of public services. And I, I think here what we really need to focus on is the quality and the take up. So actually that there is fruition of uh, um, services and benefits and not only that these are, um, are made um, available. Um, now, um, so the, the, maybe the, 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 the bottom line message, and this is what leads me really to the, uh, to the DIA, is, uh, is the following. It's if we want to have an appropriate design of, uh, of policies, um, I think we need to uh, acknowledge two things. First uh, is that the, um, the frequency of shocks, of large shocks, has increased very much um, in the last years. And we can't assume that it's only bad luck. It's very likely that big shocks with large social impacts um, are likely to become more frequent. This implies that basically we need to, to, to have a risk management, if you want, approach. You can't just wait for the shock to happen and then to respond. 
you really need to find a way to try to manage the risk and to prepare for the risk. The second point is that, uh, um, uh, again, key point, I think we really need to, to, to invest more in understanding how the economy, uh, the society, but also our governments are operating given uh, the transformation that is happening at digital level, but also at green level. It, this is, comes by, by policy, but the two, I think, are very much um, interlinked. So what, what does it mean in terms of uh, uh, dig, uh, distributional impact assessment? I think that distributional impact assessment becomes of key importance for having evidence-based uh, policy making. So uh, at full support for, for the importance. But I think we need to acknowledge some of the limitations that we are still facing. I think, um, some of the speakers will tell me that, that I'm wrong and I would be happy to, to hear so. But I, I think that uh, there are basically um, two issues. Um, one is really on, on, on the knowledge of uh, uh, digital transformation and what is coming next. And here I'm essentially uh, thinking of artificial intelligence. I think on robotization, on automa automa automation, now we are understanding it better. Artificial intelligence, I think, honestly, we have no clue, not yet. Um, second point is that the, the timeliness of the data. I think there has been a very big progress uh, made, speaking of course about social uh, um, data, uh, but still the, there are lacks in the availability of, of data uh, in order to capture social outcomes. And this is something that we need to recognize. Um, last but not least, I think we really need also need to, to be aware that uh, while we are interested in data, uh, interesting in data and in quantitative analysis, because this is important, we also need to avoid to, to force um, to have the data even if we do not have the, the right information. Because this, I think, can be really misleading for, for policy making. Um, here are my conclusions. So, uh, very quickly, um, I think we really need to be prepared for a future that is different from the past. So, uh, this doesn't mean that we need to scrap everything that we did, not at all. But uh, uh, we need to be very careful on inferring what we know from the past in order to uh, understand what is coming. Um, Second point is, is really uh, the, because of the digital transformation and the environment in which governments operate in order to respond to, to social risk is changing very deeply. Um, and this still needs to be um, understood uh, uh, properly. And then last but not least, I think it's important to recognize that the key role of social policies in order really to, to deal with shocks. And I will stop it here. Thank you very much. Many, many thanks, uh, Chinsia. You, uh, 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 you walked us through the, the different um, uh, transition mechanisms and uh, the, the uh, uh, risk management um, uh, mm. need, uh, preventive action pre being prepared. Um, also, a very uh, good point on the data and timeliness because this is, this is important for, for the policymakers uh, to be ready uh, for designing the right policy responses. Uh, now, let's give a floor to Sara de la Rica, uh, who will uh, tell us a bit more uh, about the counterfactual evaluations and uh, uh, maybe some examples from, from Spain. The floor is yours. Okay, so thanks a lot. And uh, so the first thing I want to tell, tell you today is that what I'm going to explain uh, today is a methodology uh, to uh, evaluate uh, the impact of particular interventions, which means first that I'm only talking about micro level. We are never talking about macro level whenever we talk about this methodology, first. The second is that in order to ensure that you can do this kind of uh, evaluation, you have to have the data. So whenever any client comes to our institution, Tell us, I want you to evaluate this and this. And then the second question is, OK, which is the information you have? I have this, this, this. So if the crucial information is not there, simply we cannot do impact evaluation. 
Impact evaluation, that's what I'm going to explain, is, is a very particular thing, and I think that the term has been misused. And that's what I'm going to try to explain today. I don't, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, so first is why really, once, once uh, having said that, why we really care about the assessment of, um, of, of, of policy impact. We know that we are shifting the economy in multiple ways. Um, the two transformations that we were talking today and, and yesterday, they are really uh, causing a lot of opportunities, but also disruptions that we really, really have to know. We've seen that a lot of occupations are emerging and others are uh, disappearing. And so there are a lot of portions of population that can be really suffer from these uh, opportunities. Like I was saying this morning, I think that public interventions is more needed than ever. And when I'm talking about these public interventions is uh, that once uh, you decide how to intervene, it is very important to know which is the result of such intervention, okay? How, how do you intervene? Uh, the best way to do it is through uh, active policies, uh, which means that you design particular interventions. In order to do that, you first have to, uh, to understand why. So there has to be an analysis, a, a previous analysis that, that tells you that that particular intervention is pertinent. Um, with, in, in the case that, that I'm more specialized in, which is employment, what you have is to, to, to search for uh, either training or either guidance or... But training, I would say, is probably the most important one in order to get uh, a better employment or unemployment for those that don't have, uh, have it. And then the thing is, which policies have to be? And I think that all European countries are really struggling of, of which policies have to be implemented. And then my claim here is, you, what you have to do is to implement those policies that work, okay? And that work means that their impact is positive. And this is what I'm going to, to, to go into uh, right now. And when I talk about the impact is policy, the most important thing, and I think that Cynthia has already mentioned, is that you have to identify the impact. So very many, I don't know, but in my case that I treat a lot in our institution, which is ISEA, I treat a lot with public, um, public uh, institutions, they do a particular intervention, which is a training program or which is a, di a guidance program. And then they say, my program has been really successful, you know, because 70% of people has really got unemployment afterwards. Okay, and then my question is, okay, how do you know how many of them would have been employed in the absence of such intervention? And then they look at that saying, what? And say, that is the impact of the program. The impact is not the absolute number. The impact is only the relative number relative to not having participated. Here, of course, there is a problem, right? Because what I would love would be to have an individual going into a program, look at the, the, the whatever you are looking at, you look at that, you follow the individual, we come back in time, and then say, now the same person don't go through the program. And then we look at that after. But if that person participates, then we don't see the other, which is the counterfactual, right? So we have to create the counterfactual. That is difficult. How do we do that? The magic uh, is when you have pilot studies, the same as in health, right? Nobody, nobody questions about why in, in, in the medical sector, in the health sector, some people are given a particular treatment and others are given a placebo, right? And then you measure the differences between those that take the treatment and those that take the placebo. You control for the differences. And once these differences previous to taking the medicine has been controlled for, the result between them is exactly the treatment. Okay? That is what we have to co-create in, in labor or in, or in educational attainment or in the dig, any digital uh, penetration or whatever. So these, these kind of policies that I, I've been using for employment, but also for, for educational purposes, can be applied to anything. But of course, as I say, they have to be particular interventions. It cannot be the digital transformation, which embeds thousands of things. 
No, it always go to a micro thing, okay? Okay, so um, now we are getting in, in, in the countries, uh, we are convincing um, institutions to, uh, to embed in pilot studies before scaling up. That's the only way that you can convince them uh, to do a pilot study. And then a pilot study means that you get a pool of people that are really suitable to participate in a particular intervention. And from this pool, you select randomly those who participate. You have to, of course, take information from all the individuals before and then follow both groups of individuals, right? Once you control for the differences before, then you can really assess the impact of that intervention looking at the results afterwards, okay? That is like the marvelous case. The easiest one, no econometrics required because that is random. Participation in, the, in that intervention is random. So that's like the best uh, of the world. That's not the usual one, okay? So many times I would say that 85 or 90% of the times we are in the other one, which is that observational studies where some that have particular characteristics get into a particular intervention. For instance, unemployed workers, right? Unemployed workers that do not have a job, then they get particular services. Then who do you compare with? That's more difficult, right? Even if you see um, characteristics and you control for that they are similar, there are always this sort of unobserved thing that makes someone get into a particular intervention and another doesn't. So that's more difficult. And then in order to really do that, we have to get into econometrics. And then econometrics like what? Like differences in differences. So now there, there is a whole bunch of methodology that depending on the data you have, the, 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 the intervention you are evaluating, then you have to, to sort of uh, decide which is the best methodology. But basically, the methodologies are differences in differences, matching, and regression discontinuity. When suddenly you, there is nothing, and then you have like a shock, and then it's like, like a before and after moment, okay? So they are more complicated, but still, you really approximate the counterfactual. Then, uh, this method is very good for distributional assessment. Why? Because you can measure differences in different groups of the population. So you can assess whether the impact has been better for women than for men, for the richer or for the poorer, for the older or for the younger, for immigrants or natives. So you really have a very good um, um, view of when and where and for whom that particular intervention works. That's the good thing, okay? Of course, for that, you have to have treatment and control groups for each, for, for women and men, you have to have for all. The second one is, uh, of course, the same with regions, okay? So you can see whether that works better for a particular region or for others. So it's really good to assess differences, distributional differences. With respect to data, which is the data that normally for employment you have to use? So normally here, there are like two types of data. The first is social security data, and it's that once you finish the intervention, you have to, uh, to wait for a while, and then you ask for social security records of that person. Now in Spain, this is available. This is available, you go, there is like a particular uh, secure uh, room where you can uh, say, give me the uh, social security records of these particular individuals. Everything is anonymized and all that, but you can get that, right? So that's really a, a very important thing for employment uh, interventions. The second is that it's really important to get full socioeconomic information of participants. In my case, for instance, when we intervene unemployed people, then it's very, very important to know first all sociodemographics and all the services that these persons have gone through. This is something that the unemployment services in Spain have. So that's no problem with that. Um, so in that sense, it is true, uh, and of course the services that these persons have had before the intervention, because you have to control for that. Okay, so it is pretty re um, requiring, but data exists, and this is good data. If we don't, if we didn't have this data, we really couldn't do that. And of course, then you measure things that you have in that data. 
Imagine that you are measuring some intangible thing. Then you have to go through other things and, for instance, go into interviews before and after, and then try to capture that, that objective that you really want to measure. And then, uh, just to finish, uh, just some examples that we've done very, very recently. For instance, evaluation of the impact of a subsidy to firms who hire temporarily high qualified young individuals. We've done that for the past country, and it has been a very successful uh, a policy. And the good thing about that is that we did this last year, and then this year, the Basque uh, government has increased the budget uh, for this for the measure. This is really the, 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 the final aim, that resources are really um, spent uh, properly. The second is someone that, something that I didn't, and, and I won't talk about the others, Same, some, something that I talked about a little bit before, which is collaboration between uh, um, employment services and firms. And then there is an intervention that we just evaluated, which is, uh, I ask um, firms, which is, what is what you need that I train? Uh, which are your necessities, your training necessities? Then the public employment services train for them. They, they, they use their resources or whatever to train that. But then firms have the obligation to hire after that at least part of the, part of the, of the, of the people that has been trained. This has really been a very successful uh, policy. And then they, they are going again to reinforce this policy. Okay, so this is then we are now uh, evaluating the, the recent migration reform because it has three very, very different uh, uh, issues and then we can really identify them. So what I just want to, 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 to say and to, to conclude is that this is something that really gets into the causal impact that it has very nice distributional possibilities, but it's true that it is uh, demanding in terms of data and in terms of methodology. But I think that the Commission should really go into the direction of asking for particular interventions that there is an impact evaluation, a real impact evaluation assessment afterwards. And for that, ISEAC is a specialist. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think we should examine a group that has participated in the workshop and then uh, yep. uh, compared with another group that didn't. Yeah? That's uh, <laughs> uh, maybe uh, <laughs> some, something to think of. Uh, big thanks for a sort of big uh, dive into the counterfactual uh, evaluations and how they can be used also for the uh, distributional impact uh, assessment. That was. Uh, uh, that was uh, certainly very useful. Now, uh, let um, give the floor to Salvador Barrios, who will uh, give us uh, some insights uh, to, I believe, Euromod, uh, which is a tool that is um, uh, widespread and available uh, for uh, running the distributional impact analysis. So, please, go ahead. No, no? You hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Good. Well, thanks for, for the invitation. It's, it's a pleasure, and, and it's a pleasure in particular to talk about Euromod, because this is our, let's say, favorite model in the Commission and in many places, so I'm very happy to make the promotion of the model, but I try to also, beyond selling things, a bit like, like you, huh? <laughs> uh, I, I will try to go a bit beyond. Uh, okay, so here's the first slide. So. I would like to put the discussion in a, to a more general, uh, onto a more general basis. In particular, discussing uh, what uh, are the challenges of the train transition, the way we see it, from a particular focus, which is essentially what are the implications for tax and social policy system and social benefit system. Okay, so it's a very specific angle. So. Uh, 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 Sarah talked about uh, active labour market policy, and, and there are different policies. That, that one could think about in terms of intervention, right? So, but here we'll focus on tax and, and social benefit, right? So we know that there are major structural changes ahead that are already happening, digitalization, uh, the, uh, the green transition. Uh, but if we think about these different challenges, they are of a different nature. Take digitalization, it's a structural transformation. Uh, led by technical progress, which is having 
effect that are difficult to capture, as, as Cynthia was, was explaining. But we know that these are going to have major implications. However, the nature of the policy intervention compared to uh, the green transition is likely to be different. Here we are talking about things related to privacy, to protection of worker rights, to active labor market policy and so on, which are maybe the best one to accompany these trends in terms of digitalization. If we think about the green transition, it's, it's somewhat different. We have a big challenge with this climate change and what is leading, what is likely to lead the transformation of our society and economy are policy reforms because we need to address the challenges of the climate, the climate uh, challenge. Right? So this means that in terms of distributional impact, those two things are quite different. One is kind of given external or let's say uh, largely uh, uh, exogenous to policy makers intervention. The other is precisely because there are policy reforms. And the distributional implication of this is quite different. So you know that the EU in that respect, in terms of the green transition, is very ambitious, the most ambitious uh, area of, of in, in the world with the Fit for 55 package and, and all the big, uh, very challenging objective. Uh, President von Leyen, uh, in particular, made clear that the transition should be fair uh, in order to be successful. If it's not fair, if we don't take into account distributional aspect up front, we will fail. That's by definition because of all the political challenges this is, this is raising. And we are somehow seeing that already uh, in, in different countries in national debate with the, uh, in particular the use of uh, the uh, inconvenient poses by policy measures in order to favor the green transition taken up by a populist party, for instance. So, the uh, recent communication by the Commission, led by DG Employment, in terms of putting up, up front the distributional aspect in the assessment of policies, in particular fiscal policies, but not only, also social policies, is a key aspect. This is a major, we see it as a major change from a policy perspective. So that's why, in that respect, distributional impact assessment and in the EU context, Eurobot, which is, I will explain in a minute, are so important if we want to, let's say, uh, take the, the distributional concern uh, up front. So let me talk a bit about Euromod, which is a, a micro simulation model. Basically, what it does is, is, is a tax social benefit calculator using micro data and it provides results for all European countries. Right? So the Joint Research Center where I work is in charge of, of, of this model, but we work together with policy uh, director generals such as DG Employment, ECFIN, TaxSud, and uh, uh, colleagues from, uh, from Eurostat who play a key role in terms of uh, the data. So what are the advantages of Euromod? And here is the selling part, okay? Uh, it's timely updated, which is very important. If we think about assessing uh, policy reform in nearly real time, okay? For instance, we are in 2023. Euromod already has the 2003 policies coded since September. So it can be used already to assess, for instance, the distribution and implication of the national budget plan. It provides, it uses harmonized data and modeling, which is a very good platform to uh, carry out comparison across countries. So to compare best practices, for instance, with Euromod, you can do so-called policy swaps. So you can take a policy which is implemented in one country and see what would happen if, in theory, the same policy would be applied in another country. This was very handy in the context of assessing, for instance, the uh, short-term uh, working schemes in the COVID, uh, in the COVID time, under the support of the Sure program, for instance. But you could apply it in theory to all theory, to, to all to all policies. And this is very important if you think that some countries are more advanced socially or environmentally than others. So if we think about common target, common objectives, this is something the possibility to use a model like that and data which are comparable across countries is key. And this is very much, the, let's say, the European value added, right? 
Now, what it has also, it's flexible. So that means, it's, you know, it's a tax benefit calculator, as I said, but you can combine it with other models, right? For instance, uh, we have used extensively the combination of this model with a general equilibrium model called GME3, which is uh, designed to address uh, long-term macroeconomic issues uh, related to the energy and the environment. So combining to do two models, you can analyze specific policies, in this case, energy uh, policies or environmental uh, uh, a policy with an environmental concern, you can combine this with a distributional impact assessment. The same will happen if you uh, use a standard macroeconomic model to analyze structural reform, for instance. So by combining your model with other models, you are, in terms of assessing policy, quite you are gaining a lot of flexibility. Then your model already embeds uh, tools for the assessment of distributional impact because it provides automatically a common set of indicators which can be used and comparable across countries in terms of uh, inequality or poverty impact. Right? What is important is that with such a model you can, analyze, you can analyze the impact of specific policies on specific uh, socio-economic group, right? which is very important as I will explain in a minute in the context of the green transition. Euromod is widely used within the Commission. Uh, now it's been a few years used within the Commission, and it's more and more used by the Member States. DG Reform is also active in that respect in terms of uh, proposing technical assistance to the Member States in order to, to use the model, which is very important in the current policy context. Now, Euromod is beautiful, but it has some challenges, right? So, uh, and what we are doing now is working in terms of uh, addressing those challenges together with, with the Commission services and the member state. What we need is really to keep on uh, uh, promoting such standardized approach for carrying out distributional impact assessment. And the communication of uh, DG employment of last year is, is, is very important and we can see it as really the first stone in, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, in behavior. However, these are the general principles, but what we know in the, our discussion with the member states is are in demand of more precise guidance, let's say. General principle is very nice, but we need still uh, to discuss with them uh, how to implement DIAs and possibly use Euromod in concrete terms. A recent study carried out uh, under the sponsorship of DG Employment show in particular that uh, nearly around half member states carry out on a regular basis distribution and impact assessment. So another half member states do not do this. So there is a lot to do still. The data remain a, an important stumbling block. There is a potential uh, at the member state level and Sarah mentioned this to use administrative data, which are very good because they uh, are supposed to cover the entire population. But this is not necessarily the case. For instance, if you consider tax data, many people do not, tax, do not pay taxes, right? Especially the low income category. So you're, you may be missing a specific category of income. On the other hand, administrative data compared to survey data and Euromod standard uh, model uh, uses uh, survey data, the EU SIL data. In the administrative data, you do not have like the information on many important socioeconomic characteristics of individuals, such as education level, for instance, which can be very important to assess the impact of specific policies. So there are pros and cons. I mean, the, ideally, you would like to combine the two and having the two. Right? Now, in terms of using survey data, Important progresses have been made over the last years. In particular, the EU SIL data, that is the standard data to analyze poverty and inequality in Europe, has improved its timeliness recently, and it will improve further uh, next year, right? By providing data on income in particular from the previous years, and, and so all the socioeconomic characteristics from the previous year. This is a, a big step forward. We, th we are talking about a, a major survey conducted across all European countries, and I think this is quite unique, even worldwide. So. Still, there is continuous effort to improve the 
information contained in the data. For instance, EU Seek now for income uses administrative data for all the member states, which is very relevant. And if we think about the uh, green transition in particular, there we are lagging behind. In particular, what we have want is, what we would like to have, ideally, is to uh, have the same quality of data compared to EU Silk with consumption data. And this is far from being the case, actually, because the HBAs, the Household Budget Survey, usually is provided every five years, well, in the best, in the best cases. Uh, and there are some comparability issues across countries, availability of data, and so on and so on. And this is the major issue, especially if we think that uh, the uh, important reform on the green policy side will take place on the consumption side as well. So that's, that's a major issue. So let me now provide quickly a first uh, a number of uh, 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 stylized facts regarding the, what we know or some of the things we know regarding the uh, distribution impact of the digital and green transition. Let me give the example first of uh, something that Cynthia uh, has mentioned uh, regarding uh, the uh, digital transition, which is the possibility with digitalization to potentially improve the take-up of social benefits, which is a major issue. For instance, Spain has recently uh, adopted uh, uh, a basic income, but the take-up is very low. The recent estimates are, I think, close to 40 or 50 percent, something like that, which is extremely low if you want those policies to be effective. Well, digitalization, and there are studies showing that digitalization can be very effective in order to increase the take up of policy. So, there is a recent study by Van Gestel and others uh, published this year that shows, with a concrete uh, income tested benefit reform in Belgium, that the take-up of benefit can increase three to four-fold, which is a major increase, uh, if you implement digitalization, okay? which is a major, uh, I think, uh, outcome. And here again, we could think of testing this type of policy in other, in other member states. Let me talk now about the green transition and again, some stylized facts. Uh, here, this graph, it's based on a result of a study we have conducted, or we are conducting actually at the GRC, which is showing estimates uh, combining different indicators on energy poverty. So you know that with the energy crisis, energy poverty has increased uh, in, uh, in the EU, and this is a major issue. This is a major issue in terms of shocks, like the Russian invasion to Ukraine, which provoked a substantial increase in energy prices. But it's also a big challenge in terms of thinking ahead of possible tax reform, for instance, that will increase the cost of energy, especially for household and for final consumption of household. So what this graph shows, and this is taken from uh, a project we have together with colleagues from DG Employment, which is called the AMEDI project, which is basically uh, assessing and monitoring the um, the employment and distribution impact of uh, the twin transition. Here, what we are showing is different indicate based on monetary value or survey-based uh, value across the different income size. And what we show clearly is that energy poverty, broadly speaking, is clearly systematically higher for the low-income group. So if we think about policies, uh, for instance, uh, subsidies to renovate houses, for instance. Uh, this type of policies which are very positive and go in the direction of the objective of the green transition, well, those policies, if we think, take into account this type of indicator, we may reasonably think that they are likely to be regressive, taken as such, right? So, with this kind of tool, with micro-simulation model in particular, extended to cover consumption data, you might uh, want to have, let's say, a special look at the design of policies in order to make them potentially less regressive. So introducing, for instance, some progressivity dimension in policies such as those subsidizing renovation of dwellings. Okay. 
Now, just a last a stylized fact, I will show now something on some result on skill polarization and poverty rate. And here I'm talking about digitalization. Uh, we have also conducted relatively recently a study on the impact of digitalization on poverty and inequality. So it's a joint study together with CDFOP. And what we did is take basically a very simple exercise, taking projection uh, produced by CDFOP on the skills evolution, taking into account digitalization. Okay? And we uh, classified uh, the different group of, of skills and had an impact on the employment and wages of these different groups. Right? So here what you have is the so-called skill index and its evolution uh, between 2019 and 2030. And basically, what the graph shows is that there is some polarization, right? Where you have the dark curve showing an increase on the, of the high skill, the discontinuous curve, which is for the low skill, experiencing also some increase, but the medium skill will be, uh, let's say, less, less uh, favored by those evolutions. So the question we ask in this study is, what will be the implication of these trends, which is more or less what we know today of what is likely the evolution uh, of skills to be in the future because of digitalization. The question is, what are the distributional implications? Okay. And we looked here at specifically at the impact on, of poverty, and we asked ourselves, what, are, what is the potential role, potential role played by the tax and benefit system in terms of smoothing this impact. So here you have the result for three different years. The dark bar shows you the uh, poverty uh, impact or the, poverty, the evolution of the poverty index considering gross income, so market income, okay, before the policy intervention, which plays through the tax and social benefit system, which plays automatically. Okay? If you have higher income, you pay higher taxes, you get lower benefits in principle. So that's the idea. So what you see here is that in principle, if we take, if we do not consider the impact of the tax and benefit system, poverty, given the trends and nothing else changed in this projection, given the, what we know in terms of the impact of digitalization, poverty will tend to increase. There will be kind of more polarization to some extent. So you will have an increase in poverty if you consider only uh, market income. However, if you consider that in the end what households get into their pocket is net income after they pay their taxes and get the social benefit, in that case, we see that poverty will not increase. It will remain relatively stable and even slightly decrease, right? Considering policies of today and considering only the uh, future skill change as, as the only structural change in the economy. So this is a stylized result, but it's important to note that the message from here is that the current existing tax and benefit system provide a significant buffer, right? We, in Europe, compared to other areas of the world, uh, redistribute quite a lot income. And this should provide some guarantees at least some guarantees in terms of the potential impact uh, of digitalization, for instance. Now, this doesn't prevent and this doesn't uh, contradict the idea that if you take, the, if you consider the green transition and if you consider that the changes impacting households related to the green transition are going to be mainly policy driven, then the, the interpretation is relatively different. And there you really need to consider on a systematic basis using distributional impact assessment the impact of those policy-led changes on household income. And you may want to design the policy changes in a way that they are progressive or at least not regressive. And that's about it from my side. Thanks. Many thanks. Uh, many thanks. 
And just to wrap up on the sort of uh, selling the Euromod, uh, you, sh you didn't say that it's available for free, Jeez. the tool. <laughs> so um, uh, please use more EDIA, Euromod is there, and uh, we will hear from uh, Karina Dolly about uh, the Irish experience, please. Thank you very much, um, and thanks for sticking with us. It's been a long day, and the good news is I only have four slides, so hang in there, okay? So, I'm going to talk to you today, I, so I'm actually going to cover three topics in those four slides, um, so that was a bit of a, maybe a missile. I'm going to start by talking about DIA in Ireland, and I, I think Ireland presents a, a good and interesting case study of how to conduct effective DIA. I'm then going to show you how DIA has been used in Ireland um, in, the, in designing the parameters of one of our green policies, so carbon taxation. And then lastly, I'm going to switch tack completely and talk about automation and what we know about how it has affected income distribution and what role DIA might have to play in the future in mitigating any potential negative effects. Okay, so having said that, um, there's a really strong history of DIA in Ireland. Um, so the European Commission study that's already been referred to found that Ireland was one of very few countries that systematically produces a DIA in its draft budgetary plan. So that means when policies are being decided upon in the annual budget, there is an assessment of their effect on the distribution of income and on particular family types at the very least. More recently, we now have an assessment on um, gender, so the effect on men versus women. Um, the, the model that underlies all of this distributional impact assessment historically is the switch model. So the switch model has been in existence for 30 years in Ireland um, in various forms. So since 2020, it's actually based on the Euromod platform, which is very helpful for cross-country research. Um, but I work at the ESRI in Dublin, and my team at the ESRI, uh, which is a, it's an independent research institute, we maintain and develop the switch model. We then Firstly, use that in our own academic research, but we also provide it to government departments based on a funding agreement um, so that they can conduct their own DIA around budget time. Um, the reason I mention this is because it's a relatively unique arrangement in Europe um, from talking to colleagues and policymakers elsewhere in Europe. Um, the model either tends to be um, owned and housed um, by the government department or it tends to be owned and housed by an academic institute and only used for academic research. So in Ireland, we have this sort of um, relationship, if you like, very much based on trust, where we provide the model and they provide some funding. Uh, and then what's really important about that relationship is that we provide training whenever necessary. And if you, I don't think Ireland is unique in this aspect. The turnover in the civil service is quite high, which means that from year to year, you might have new people coming in, being expected to run a distributional impact assessment with no idea where to start. So that's our job to um, you know, teach them the basics of the model. And we also help with ad hoc requests. So something uh, typical around the annual budget would be, we're considering a policy of this sort of shape. Can you model a template for us so that we can change the parameters and see what happens. And all that has to happen under the auspice of budget secrecy. So there's a real level of trust required there. So I just thought that was meant, worth mentioning because it is relatively unique. But that also means that at budget time, we conduct a distributional impact assessment, which we publish, but the departments also do their own one. So there's that sort of checks and balances, if you like. So distributional impact assessment has been used um, in the design of green policies in Ireland. In 2010, we introduced a carbon tax, and in 2021, the government committed to increasing that ta tax by €7.50 Euro per tonne every year until 2029. Now, obviously, there were concerns that this would impact the lowest income households the most, um, because carbon tax tends to be a regressive policy. There were also concerns that those households are the least able to switch away from carbon-intensive goods and services and there was a need to do something to compensate them. Um, so some colleagues of mine at the ESRI were asked to look at the distributional impact of this increase in carbon tax, this seven euro 50 per tonne increase, and then to use one third of the revenue that that increase would generate and design policies, a suite of options, if you like, to compensate the lowest income households for that increase. Um, this is 
sort of not the quick fix that we heard about in the last session. It's more like um, since it has been uh, it has been done every year since this carbon tax increase came in, I think it would be hard to reverse what policymakers are doing in this respect. But anyway, this was the results. So if you look at the, the y-axis here, this is the gains or loss in disposable income as a percentage of disposable income. Here I have um, split households into equally sized groups ranging from the lowest income decile to the highest income decile. And the blue line down here shows the effect of carbon tax on household disposable income without any compensating measures. So you can see that typical regressive pattern. We've got lower, uh, higher income losses at the bottom of the income distribution, lower income losses further up. Um, these are some of the options that my colleagues came up with for combating that regressive pattern. Most of them are around increasing the core rate of social welfare payments, increasing the extra amount that people get if they have children and they're on social welfare, or increasing the payments that are made to older people who either live alone or who are eligible for um, some support in um, their fuel costs. So these were the options that were sort of proposed, suggested as progressive policy reforms. And you can see that while the bottom three income deciles are more than compensated for the effect of rising carbon tax, the upper income deciles are not, and that kind of maintains this incentive to switch away from carbon intensive goods for those households. And um, so the, the result of this was actually that since that those annual increases have come in, government has every year introduced some sort of revenue recycling where they use a certain proportion of the extra income to compensate low income households. Um, so completely switching topic now, um, I want to talk to you about a very specific aspect of the digital transformation and that's automation or the adoption of robots and I want to talk to you about what we know about how the adoption of robots affects income distribution and um, so we know an awful lot about how the adoption of robots affects wages and affects employment but how those two effects transmit into income distribution is a little bit more complicated because shocks to wages and shocks to employment interact firstly with household formation when we're thinking about household level incomes. Um, so you might have one person in a household in a very um, high tech job who's actually gaining from the effects of automation because they, you know, code, they write the code or they service the machines. You might have another person in the household who actually loses out because they're in a low skill manual job that gets replaced by a robot. So household formation can provide some sort of risk mitigation so just because there is an employment or wage effect um, from automation doesn't mean that that's going to show up at the household level when we consider income distribution. The other reason why, let's say, an increase in wage inequality or a decrease in employment might not show up in um, our measure of income distribution at the household level is because of tax and welfare policies, which are specifically designed to cushion income shocks of this type. So it makes it an empirical question. We have to go to the data to find out what's actually happening. So this chart shows the effect of the adoption of robots between 2006 and 2018 in a sample of European countries on the distribution of income. On the y-axis is the change in the Gini index, so an increase means an increase in income inequality, and you have the, uh, the various countries in our sample across here. If you have a look at the orange dots for a start, this shows the change in the Gini index as a result of the adoption of robots between 06 and 18 in these countries. And um, what I want you to notice first about this is that it's very small. Okay, so the highest effect here, this, you can't see the axis here, but this is at 1.5% of the 20, 2018 value of the Gini index. So in terms of Gini index terms, that's half a point of the Gini index. It's very low when you consider this 12 year period. And most of the other countries have effects far lower than this. So really, we were maybe a little bit surprised when we first saw this result. We thought, well, wow, the adoption of robots hasn't affected income inequality at all. So we dug a little bit deeper. And, and the dots that you see here are the same as the dots from the previous graph. The scale has just changed, which is why they look much lower. And um, if you look at the yellow bars now, this is the change in the Gini index um, on a different income concept, so of market income, which is pre-tax and transfer income. And the highest effect here is about 6% of the 20, 2018 value of the Gini index. This is much larger. So there really was a measurable effect 
of automation on inequality in pre-tax and transfer income. And what happened is these blue bars here show how the benefit system mitigated that effect. So the benefit system did, really did all of the heavy lifting here compared to the tax system, which did very little and which actually barely shows up here. Some of these gray bars, that's the tax system. Um, so really the, the lack of effect of the adoption of robots on income distribution in these countries over a 12 year period is really thanks to the benefit system in these countries, thanks to the existing social welfare systems, not to discretionary changes to, to the automatic stabilizers. Um, so this is kind of good news, right? So our tax and welfare systems are doing what they're supposed to do. They're, they're automatically stabilizing shocks to the income distribution. And I mean, I think it, it's good news to look at this in a historic perspective and say, well, that, that worked pretty well. Um, we haven't seen this massive increase in income inequality that you might have expected. Um, but where it might also be more useful is looking forward. So it's a lot easier to model the effect of something like a carbon tax on income distribution compared to modeling the effect of digitalization or robotization on income distribution. I don't think we have the data for that kind of forward modeling yet, although I, I do like the set of up forecast for skills. You could, you could do something with that. If you could inject a forecasted shock to income distribution as a result of digitization, you could then you could design tweaks to tax and welfare policy to actually cushion those shocks if, if a cushioning effect was needed. Um, but you could also just see how the existing tax and welfare system is going to cope with those expected changes. So I think that while we don't have great information on that yet, I've no doubt that we will in a couple of years, we will get better at um, modeling what we expect from AI, from digitization, from robots, um, as we gather more data. And we will be able to use distributional impact assessment in that sense, in the same way that we do today for things like green policies. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Uh Many thanks. Great, many thanks. Uh, that it was very nice to see a very specific example of uh, first how the distribution impact analysis can be done, and second, what could the response of the policymakers be, and how effective uh, uh, it can actually um, uh, be vis-à-vis uh, -vis the income distribution. So. so now we can see very specifically what uh, is the power of the of, of this tool. Um, now we have um, some minutes for um, questions. I, I don't know if we have any Slido questions to to show uh, on the screen. I will uh, I will read them uh, uh, read them out so that uh, you can uh, you can respond. The first. Uh, Data and timeliness were mentioned. Where, where do you see the most pressing needs and avenues to address them? Um, and, and I think that comes also uh, with the, sort of the quality of data and availability of data that you mentioned, which is absolutely necessary to conduct a, a um, uh, reliable distribution impact analysis. I don't know who wants to take this up. Uh, maybe Salvatore, as you uh, yeah, mentioned I, this. I, yeah. uh, I think the, the big uh, improvement, uh, the biggest potential is on consumption data, clearly. So household budget survey is far from having the standard of the EU mm -hmm. database, which looks at, uh, at income and labor condition. And I think this is a major issue, knowing that uh, policy reform for the green transition will, uh, will affect consumption uh, to, to a large extent. So I think this is where the biggest challenge uh, lies. Then there is a structural thing is that in terms of survey data, you will always have data lagging behind because by definition you cannot think of uh, uh, the uh, micro data of being the same nature as the macro data where you can do let's say forecasting and, and now casting even so there are some progress being made in terms of now casting some improvement combined in different sources of information but i think uh, the uh, uh, we, we cannot claim or we cannot pretend having the same timeliness as as macro data mm -hmm. that's for yeah. sure yeah yeah, with respect to microdata, in order to do this kind of interventions, uh, one of the, I think, that at least from our, from our experience, is that there is a lot of data 
in administration. They really they collect a lot of data, but basically for managing regions. So they have to, to, to manage um, many aids, uh, many subsidies, many transfers, and, and they do, do pretty well. But they do it in a very segmented way. So there is no integrability of the data. So you may find a lot of information in a particular PC of a person that eats in, in, in a particular um, department but then nobody else shares that information. So uh, in order for, for, for impact evaluation being you know, extended, it's really, really important, the interoperability of recruiting data and that you know, there is like a unified a way to find the, the, the information. Yeah, that's a very good point because this is what we hear a lot from uh, other stakeholders and uh, member states as well. Uh, what are Sarah, and maybe <laughs> just because that's a point I think which is very important is the availability of the administrative data. I mean, some progress, huge progress have been made. The academic world has shown that this data is accessible. Uh, still, at the European level, it's very patchy, it's very country specific. In some countries, it's absolutely excluded. In other countries, uh, it's, it's possible, and we see the progress in mm -hmm. terms of providing the basis for policy impact assessments is fundamental. Mm -hmm. So, survey data are excellent, they are needed. But administrative data also is a field where we need to, need to, okay. to do a much progress as well. So maybe I'll uh, move to, to another question. Um, there is one on uh, uh, to what extent uh, we can stress test public policies uh, to various shocks and how can DIA can be useful. We did a stress test for banks. Can we do it for social policies? I, I can come in on that. I think that's actually already done then of the academic literature mm -hmm. that's out there. So uh, this became quite popular during the financial crisis um, when we didn't have the data available for how the economy looked now, what the labor market looked like, what um, income and wages looked like. Um, uh, researchers introduced shocks to the data. So, okay, we think that unemployment's increased by five percentage points, let's shock the data. In, you know, increase unemployment among the groups that, you know, look like they are suffering from this the most and see how the tax and welfare systems respond. And I, the results were very varied across European countries. Some countries had very strong safety nets, others didn't at all. And I think if you were to conduct those same stress tests now, probably not too much would have changed in terms of the patterns between countries. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very useful exercise to conduct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anybody on stress tests? I mean, there was an also interesting question that uh, uh, should we have or can we have uh, uh, digital tax uh, and uh, whether this would be uh, possible or meaningful to run the EIA on this kind of uh, uh, intervention, uh, I assume, uh, ex-ante. I mean, th there is a lot of talk about, introduce, uh, about taxing robots and uh, taxing artificial intelligence to fund our social protection systems. So ha have you... Um, have you maybe done that? Uh, you, you've uh, tested a carbon tax? Uh, uh. Not, not a digital tax. Taxation of digital companies is another matter. I mean, the Commission mm -hmm. has looked at that. But that's very specific to companies. So making inference from that onto a household is, is very difficult. So uh, no, I, I, I don't think to provide an answer, I don't think it's relevant for distribution and impact assessment, at least in a direct way like we are thinking now. Just, just one reflection. I think it's, it depends what you want to tax. So digital taxation is uh, um, a digital tax. Sorry, you want to tax digital companies. You want to tax digital services. Uh, it really depends on the object of, of the taxation, and this may have uh, different um, impacts, including potentially uh, distributional impact. Mm -hmm. But it's it's really depend on the definition. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the social forum is very much rounded around the digital transition and the artificial intelligence, etc. And we heard from um, several of you that uh, the digital transitions actually do not show uh, in terms of uh, impact. Uh, uh, you have alluded to some um, underlying reasons for that, but maybe can we have a round uh, on uh, is that the case uh, and why is that the case? Maybe I start with this. This is indeed one of the kind, quite surprising results that, that we got. 
I mean, as I said, we are looking at the decade between 2010 and 2019. No? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think over this period, uh, if you want the, the digital transformation, it happened, but it was quite smooth. Uh, and there was, uh, at least this is what we get, some time of adaptation uh, to the change in order to, to avoid too big disruptions in terms mm -hmm. of uh, unemployment, employment, uh, the, the traditional um, uh, social outcomes. Now, I think that there, there may be other explanations. Uh, as I said, maybe we are not properly capturing everything that is mm -hmm. going on associated with the digital transformation. These are the years post financial crisis. So that there are also other things happening at, at, at the same time. And it's very difficult to disentangle what is the, the specific impact of the digital transformation on uh, the results that, that we see. My take is that uh, we need to um, try to look at the post-2020, uh, where things have accelerated. Basically, we have a number of uh, um, technologies which have become mature and they have been um, adopted in a much larger scale. Uh, and then, of course, we have changes like chat GDP. I think we are researchers. We are seeing the, really the impact of, uh, of these changes on our daily life. Um, what kind of impacts on um, um, employment, uh, labor um, uh, efficiency, uh, for instance, uh, uh, labor productivity, and potentially mm -hmm. on, um, on, on employment. This is really what we need, to, we need still to see. Yes, please. I think that uh, digital transformation is a, a very big thing. Uh, it's a black box. And uh, uh, as I said before, I am a micro person and not a macro person. So I think that what we could do, and I, we probably have to do, is to go pieces and pieces. So what you talk about when you talk about digital transformation, and then you say, okay, one possibility, for instance, one thing that we are, perhaps we do now is, a weather penetration of technology in schools, which is a digital transformation, is making any impact on the competences of, of uh, boys and girls. And then you just take schools, you look at their competences that are measured by PISA and other studies before and then after. You can do that in a period of two years. Of course, it's a micro thing. You don't, uh, uh, you don't address the whole uh, question of digital transformation, but you look at a particular mm -hmm. case and then you really can get, get, can get answers uh, about that. So my view is that, that we have to, to look at pieces of digital transformation and then look at what, what do you want to look at uh, on what, impact on what, and then try to measure. On another um, issue, for me, the, inst the, the, the comparing 10 years in advance is to put too many things in that block, mm -hmm. uh, black box, which is 10 years. Mm -hmm. So uh, identifying the impact there is, for me, impossible. Okay, very good. Uh, we have still one more uh, activity for, for you. Um, we wanted to have a poll, a uh, Slido poll, uh, for, for you to tell us what are the keywords that you have taken uh, up from um, today's, uh, you can use two words, um, uh, and we will run a, a, a poll uh, um, on Slido. And um, while you will be doing that online or, or, or here, I may ask the same for our panel of speakers, sort of maybe more than two words, so but one sentence. What, do you, what is your key message you, you would like to give to close uh, today's session? Who wants to start? Salvador. But that's what I say in my presentation. So uh, basically we should, uh, especially for the green transition, we should take special care of the distributional impact, but it's true for other reform. Uh, and we know this, I mean, this issue has become more evident since the financial crisis. The distributional dimension is key for the success of, of policy reform. And I think this is, the, this is my sentence. Okay. I think you need to use the mic. I'm, I'm not going to be original because my key word is data. <coughs> um, I think uh, we are speaking about distributional impact assessment and in order to, to have a proper distributional impact assessment, you need to have uh, good data. 
Um, we're also speaking about the digital transformation. A lot of the digital transformation is about data and the use of, of data. So that would be for me the key mm -hmm. word. Um, following on from the, the, the cry for data, um, I would be concerned that in the transformations that we're going to see over the next number of years, that there's a risk that vulnerable groups will get left behind. But we do have the tools to ensure that that doesn't happen, provided we have the right data. And just to finish, I would say that identifying the impact of any policy is an issue and has to be taken into account. Yeah. Uh, many thanks. I will not try to sum up the, the, the whole discussion, um, uh, but I think the message from today was uh, clear that we are um, facing a lot of transitions that are under, uh, either ongoing or ahead of us, be it linked to digital artificial intelligence, uh, green transitions, transitions on the labor market, um, and the overall societal developments. And therefore, we can expect many reforms to be enacted, uh, uh, and some of them are being enacted um, uh, in, uh, in the member states or around the world. And that is why the distribution impact assessment can be very, very useful tool to actually um, understand what these reforms mean for uh, uh, for uh, the different parts of the society to make sure that we uh, uh, are able to address the uh, potential shortcomings of these reforms, especially when it comes to uh, inequality and uh, poverty. So with that, I would finish, and I would like to ask for a big applause for our panelists. <laughs> Many thanks again.